All right, here we are. Welcome, everyone. The man of the hour, and I would say the man of the year, Carson ah. and HTMX, and this uh, insane madness that's rolling in the world of hypermedia, um, slaying, or actually, the honeymoon is over, I would say, for React and all these big. Uh, uh, you know, yes, the code base is huge and everybody's rolling with it, but it's just now the drudgery of the unhappy marriage. Wow. <laughs> the, yeah. mistress, the mistress called HTMX entered the room. So a lot of people <clears throat> from what I can see are tempted, flirting. So Carson and, and I think some of uh, your uh, other colleagues have written a book and published it, and it's making big rounds and uh, big impression on people. So over to you, Carson, but can you walk us through like how it came to be? What is it? And sure. Well, first, <laughs> first of all, I want to say thank you because you had me on before HTMX was cool. Um, and uh, so uh, we had a great talk, you know, I think you said almost two years ago, it doesn't seem that long to me, but um, and uh, yeah, you know, in the last year and especially in the last couple of months, to be honest, um, HTMX has gotten a lot of attention from just random people that I wouldn't have expected to uh, get interested in it. But I do I agree with you that there uh, is a sense in web development that things are maybe a little too complicated. And uh, I've been like you, I've been saying that for a while. Um, certainly, you know, I, I want to have a little bit of nuance in that discussion. There are times when complicated approaches are warranted. but. Um, but in general, I think people have jumped into the the really heavy client side code model a little too aggressively, and they're starting to see the problems with that model. And uh, the irony, as you know, is that the, the web in many ways was a response against that initial problem, right? Like it was, is this how do we generalize this? How do we make a lightweight or not really a lightweight client, but how do we? make the client uh, smart in a specific way so that we don't have to put a bunch of logic into the client. Um, and that's the uniform interface that we talked about in our last talk. Um, so yeah, I've been, you know, for the listeners who don't know what HTMX is, it's a, it's a small JavaScript library that you can use in your web application. And uh, you add attributes to HTML and it increases the expressiveness of HTML. So it makes it possible for you to build more sophisticated user interfaces uh, with just plain HTML and attributes uh, by basically hooking into the Ajax functionality. It's typically only available in JavaScript and it does it in a particular way. Um, but one thing that I, uh, I this, the library actually started off as a, a library called intercooler.js and uh, I didn't really understand what I was doing when I created that library. But um, as I put it out there and tried to convince people to, to look at it, some people started saying, hey, this is neat because this is really a RESTful library. You're using, you're using HTML the way it was designed to be used, or your hypermedia. And so that, that term kept coming up, hypermedia, and I went back. I kind of understood REST at the time, but not really. I certainly didn't have the understanding I have of it now. Um, and in particular, that uniform interface concept. Um, but they kept this just kept coming up, coming up, and I looked more and more into it, and was like, oh wow, you know, hypermedia is an interesting idea. It is, it's a system architecture. It's not just a characteristic of a particular document. <laughs> you have to have an entire system around it. Um, this is one, you know, thing that I think uh, one one problem that you run into when you talk about REST and Hadios and and stuff like that. Uh, uh, today is that a lot of users associate that with the JSON API world because that's the only place they've ever heard it. And it's typically in a negative light, right? Um, and uh, so uh, the what's what's difficult to communicate uh, to, to people is that hypermedia to be effective in any event, in my opinion, requires an entire system to work. And so uh, you need to have a hypermedia, um, some sort of hypermedia, HTML, for example, um, which is a hypertext, a subset of hypermedias. Um, but, uh, but then you also have to have a, uh, and this is something that I've come to understand really well in the last year, year and a half, you also have to have a client, uh, a hypermedia client. And uh, building a hypermedia client is non-trivial. 
uh, it's, it's a complicated thing to do. Um, and uh, browsers are obviously extremely sophisticated uh, uh, pieces of software and they to understand HTML is not trivial. Um, so some people sometimes get incredulous when they first encounter my writings because they think I'm advocating for HTML to be consumed by like scripts or you know by some third party integration or whatever machine to machine communication. And I'm not advocating for that because uh, the, the hypermedia itself, in order to be effective, has to be uh, consumed by hypermedia client, in, in my opinion. Um, and so th in any event, that, that's all to set the stage for uh, the book. The book is called Hypermedia Systems. And that's why we called it Hypermedia Systems, because we felt that there was there's a broader system in place rather than just like, hey, here's a hypermedia. This is, you know, some people sometimes say, well, why don't I just add links to my JSON? And, it's like, and my response is, well, because the client needs to understand that too. That uniform interface requires understanding on both sides of the, the, the wire to really be uh, taken advantage of effectively. So in any event, okay, so we wrote a book on me uh, Dennis uh, at Simsec, um, who has worked with me for uh, for uh, about two years um, on uh, HTMX and HyperScript. Um, Adam Stepinski, who is uh, the creator of Hyperview, which is a hypermedia that's mobile oriented. It's a, it's a mobile hypermedia, effectively, and he uh, he provides he I think his his system is actually much more uh, ambitious and more of an achievement at, at some level than what HTMX is. Um, but we all got together because we were all interested in hypermedia and no one really talks about hypermedia anymore for some reason. And so we said, well, why don't we write a book about it? And uh, we, we had a publisher who was interested in the book um, and uh, they got about halfway through it and then did some market research and just felt like there wasn't enough interest in the topic, which is probably true a year ago. Um, and so they decided to cancel the book, but then they released the rights back to us. And so we said, okay, well, let's take it. We'll rewrite it to be the book that we wanted because we wanted it to be more, I think a little bit more technical and a little bit just, there was a more obvious structure to me than what they were kind of, they had their way of doing it. And so uh, we rewrote the book. Um, thankfully, uh, we're able to reuse most of the content, but we, re we rewrote it in what I think is a more logical progression through the various uh, ideas that are presented in it. And, uh, and then we just released it two and a half weeks ago now um, as a uh, self-published book on Amazon. Um, so if people who are interested can go to hypermedia.systems. That's the website for the book. The content of the book is available free online. Um, so you can go and you can read the whole book online, um, but you can buy it in hard copy. And you can also buy it uh, from Kindle or on Kindle. And we'll probably figure out other ways to release the book as well. This was a pretty big effort. Um, we had to do our own typesetting. Dennis did most of that. Uh, we were very lucky to get an editor um, who worked with us uh, kind of pro bono or on a, uh, on a percentage basis, um, which is really nice. Um, so it's a pretty, uh, I, th I think it's a pretty clean book. There's definitely some uh, errors in it, but uh, we got most of them. And uh, so the, the hard copy version is expensive. It's 55 bucks, but you get a heck of a book for 55 bucks. I will say it's a big, thick, we tried to make it like a textbook because we kind of figured like, look, you can read it online for free. So if you're going to buy this a physical copy of this book, it should be a, a significant thing, like a, a large physical here. I've got a copy. I mean, this is a big book, <laughs> you know, big, big thick book. and tall. Yeah, big, thick and tall. It's supposed to be a oh. textbook. It's supposed to be reminiscent of like, uh, you know, the, the textbooks from yesteryear in school and so forth. Um, we also have Berkeley Graphics, uh, who uh, Neil at Berkeley Graphics uh, does fantastic work and he designed the cover. So I think the cover is really, I don't know how well you can see that, but the cover is really neat and the back is awesome. And the spines, it's just awesome. It shows really nice. Can you quickly, if I may interrupt, uh, just walk yeah. us through the for people who are not familiar, the meaning of, of the what's displayed on the front cover. Oh, so this is, um, so this was, these are, um, it's informational. So it's stuff like, okay, a click, for example, let's see, where's a good one? Um, well, here, like, for example, an HTTP get occurs, 
and then the response is going to be 200 okay and then the ajax swap attribute takes over and takes the response and swaps it into the dom and so it's got a bunch of those kind of laid out where like something happens like an event i think there's like yeah like a hover here um let's see where's a good one um like re the read action um leads to an ajax get of the book and stuff like that so it kind of tries to visually capture the way htmx works the the core of htmx is an event occurs it triggers an http interaction and then the, the html response to that action is swapped into the dom somehow so that's the core mechanic i would say of htmx and so the cover tries to capture that as best we can it's like a tldr right on the front door. yeah right <laughs> exactly yeah um so uh uh, so, so that was that was how the book kind of came to, to be, um, and uh, uh, again, it's available on just hypermedia.systems. Um, and uh, but the content of it, uh, which I think is what we're going to talk mainly about, and I think probably you're the the listeners of this podcast. I'm not going to get into the muck of HTMX. It's a tool. There's a lot of details um, to it, and you can take a look at the um, either the hgmx.org website, or you can go and look at some of the later chapters. But I think for listeners in this podcast, and since Alex, I know you're more, you have a more philosophical mind. Um, I think the chapters that are most interesting to talk about are chapters one, probably through four. Um, so chapter one, uh, and again, so the book is called Hypermedia Systems. And what we want, wanted to do with the book was to communicate um, uh, not only to older developers who, who know something else, but mainly to younger developers, many of whom, when doing web development, all they know is React. They don't understand, they, they, you know, I'm older as the gray in my beer indicates. And so I, I, I grew up with the web when it was still the web, when it was still anchor tags and forms, and that's how you did everything, maybe a little bit of jQuery as well. Um, but anchors and forms were really the bread and butter of web development. And uh, in the last, say 10 years that has become uh, you know, untrue it's no longer the case that when web developers start out they learn that stuff they they might you know get it very briefly as like oh this is how these like document like you know websites work but it's not how web applications work for sure web applications are react you gotta have a json api and all that kind of stuff and so we really wanted to write a book that the younger generation um, could read and get this very quick introduction. I mean, I don't know how quick it is, but it's reasonably quick and focused reintroduction uh, or introduction to uh, hypermedia and, and explain here's why a link is special. <laughs> here's why the form is special. Um, and uh, you know, this is this is what REST really means. Like you, you know, when you're building a, a, a just a plain old website, you're you're building a restful on top of a restful system. So it's not just some weird JSON thing. Um, so we really did, you know, try and shoot for that younger generation. Someone did point out that it's pretty funny that we're trying to sell books to like, millennials and, and Zoomers who don't who famously do not read books, but <laughs> But you know, it, it's it's fine. It's online too, so you can read it there if you want. Um, but uh, but the book, you know, I, I like books. They they force you to focus, and uh, the, the younger generation could probably would probably enjoy that experience since they don't get too much of it. So um, so that's the what the book was targeted at. And uh, the first three chapters are hypermedia reintroduction. It's chapter one. Chapter two is components of a hypermedia system. Chapter three is a web 1.0 application. And in that chapter, we'll talk about that in a second, um, uh, but we basically build like an old school web app, the, the way web apps used to be built before uh, in, the old, in the olden days. And then chapter four is uh, called uh, extending HTML as a hypermedia. And so I figured what we could do is we could just talk about each of those chapters and kind of go over the contents of them. Um, so let's start with hypermedia reintroduction. Re um, in chapter one, and we we go over the history of hypermedia. It's kind of interesting, you know. It's worth knowing, um, but then we really focus in on HTML and uh, HTML, how it came about and what it is, and in particular, the essence of HTML being anchor tags and form tags. Um, and so, uh, in under in order to understand what makes something hypermedia, you have to understand that what a hypermedia control is. 
And hypermedia control is the general term for what both anchors and forms is. It's a, it's a piece of information embedded directly in a document that specifies some sort of uh, interaction with a remote system. Um, that's, that's what a hypermedia control is. Uh, it's a not, it, it it's not a perfect definition, but that's a broad definition of it. Um, it, it does involve, uh, at least for me, when I was learning about it when I was young, it kind of evokes some kind of a leap. You're, you're, as you're reading, you can leap all of a sudden to some other dimension. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, no, that's, and I think that's good, especially on the link side. But I do think that that can lead, like, you know, forms are another type of hypermedia control and they don't have that same, like you're going somewhere else. I think one problem that you run into um, is that people, when they think about hypermedia, they often think about just like clicking around in documents and like, the, the, you know, the link is just so dominant in our thinking when we, when we talk about hyper HTML and so forth, that we don't, the, the, the form really is a very special thing in that sense. We call it, we call it hyperlink. We don't call it hyperform, right? So yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, the hyperform, so, uh, forms, so again, just to finish that definition, uh, hypermedia control uh, is something that specifies within a hypermedia. It's what makes the thing a hypermedia, uh, a nonlinear, or a, 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 in my mind, a network-based interaction of some sort, going somewhere, issuing a request to some remote system, and then doing something. Now, in the case of the link, that is going to be an HTTP GET to some URL, and then the response is going to be loaded into the browser window. That's the mechanic of the uh, anchor uh, uh, hypermedia control. Um, forms forms didn't, were not in HTML1. So HTML1 was uh, what I think a lot of people today think of as hypermedia, and that it was just links. And you could link documents together, and it was it was a big jump forward because you know previously you had to use gopher or whatever to get to some system and find things and you know it was very difficult so so html i don't want to uh, denigrate html1 it was a massive jump but i really think html2 when html2 came out and when it introduced the form tag the underappreciated mm -hmm. the underappreciated form tag in my opinion it then, then we, sorry to interrupt would it be fair yeah. to say that html1 was uh idempotent and then with HTML2, we introduced the ability to change the state on the server. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. where I was going with that. So uh, HTML1, no, no, no. HTML1 was read only. You know, it was immutable. The, the web was immutable at that point. Um, but HTML2 introduced the form tag. And the form tag really transformed the web from this interesting, like kind of, the, the, if you go back and you look at the old, takes on hypermedia they were all about clicking around and navigation and and so forth but this idea of like not only can you navigate around this crazy system but you can update stuff in it as janky as it is you know the form is definitely like the, the normal web mechanic is a little janky i'm not going to deny that it's, it was this yeah go ahead so i still remember the amazing excitement my my head exploded when i realized was back in 2000, uh, sorry, uh, 1993. I forgot the exact date. And I realized yeah. I can actually, 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 I can actually publish my thoughts. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that without, without be having to go through some editorial, you know, because I, yeah. I was publishing things in printed media, but it, right. it just goes forever and ever and back and forth. And, you know, I'm like, look, yeah. I can, I can write up a little essay, whatever, and I can just publish it. It just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah. Freedom. Yeah, no, I know. I know. I wish. Uh, well, maybe someday. You know, we're kind of going back to a closed system in some ways. So maybe uh, you know, the web will. I don't know. I, I have a lot of faith in the web and its ability to even survive the shenanigans with Chrome and so forth. But that's a separate conversation. Uh, but know, Cory Doctor, uh, sorry, just to interject. Uh, I just read recently yeah. one thing. The Cory Doctor of. Uh, you probably follow Cory Doctor. I don't know. Uh, Boy, I, you know, I know, I know him, but I don't know if I yeah. follow him closely. He he's a big advocate of he he's a, a freedom fighter for the web, and he said the the web curdled mm -hmm. because of the high tech bros. They they curdled it, yeah. so he's trying to to uh, rescue it and go back to the <laughs> open freedom. 
Well, I think some people would characterize me as a high tech bro, and I am on his side. So, Corey, if you need a high tech bro on the inside, I'm your guy. Oh, oh. <laughs> the difference is not high tech bro, big tech bro. Oh, big, big tech bro. I'm definitely not big tech bro. No, he's, um, really, <laughs> he's big tech. Yeah. 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 So, well, but in any event, to get back to on on the the main path here. Um, when the form tag was introduced in HTML or HTML, excuse me, HTML2, um, it, we, the web transformed from this read-only system into a read-write system. Um, and there were a lot of problems with the way that it works, but nonetheless, it worked. Um, and uh, it worked really, really well. And so that kind of led to the web 1.0 application revolution that happened and is still to an extent happening where people uh, build traditional HTML based applications that do interesting stuff and are able to update data and uh, so on and so forth. And so um, and the form tag is uh, again, a hypermedia control, um, but a really transformative one where it turned the web from an interesting distributed document system into an in a, in a, into a very compelling, in my mind, distributed application architecture. Okay, now we can actually write applications with this. Um, so fine. So that's uh, uh, and that's really the crux of of what a hyper, what, again why we call it a hypermedia system. It's got to be this whole system that works, not just you know HTML itself, but the whole thing. Um, and uh, so that was great. That went along for I don't know a decade or so. Um, uh, and then, uh, but JavaScript was there, and JavaScript you know uh, was increasingly there over time. Um, and then around. 2012, uh, sort of, and between 2012 and 2014, I would say, there was a real sea change in the way web applications were built, where not everyone, but a lot of people moved over to uh, what today is called the single page application approach, um, a JavaScript heavy approach where you write a fair amount of client side code in JavaScript that consumes uh, APIs that are typically uh, written uh, or, or typically uh, return JSON rather than uh, rather than HTML. Um, and there were good reasons for that, and we outline those reasons in the book. The primary ones, in my estimation, uh, are that uh, the, the hypermedia approach didn't stop advancing, um, and not you know it, it stopped advancing. Uh, theoretically, but more practically, the UI just never evolved past this giant refresh of the screen that occurred when you clicked on a link or when you submitted a form. And uh, that, 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 that refresh is jarring and visually disruptive, and it makes the application feel bad, it just doesn't feel very good. Um, you lose your scroll state and all this crazy stuff. And uh, so you were able to avoid all that with these more JavaScript heavy approaches. And uh, so I think in my opinion is that that was really the, the thing that drove people over to single page applications. It was not the fundamental network architecture or any conceptual, anything conceptual about uh, HTML. It was instead just the practical consideration that you can build way cooler UIs with JavaScript than you can with HTML, with plain HTML. Can I ask a question at this point? Yeah. Do you mind if I uh, interrupt? No, not at all. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to uh, figure out, um, my impression, and like you're saying, uh, around that time when we switched to single page application, is also that um, the big tech, uh, you know, giants who were trying to build walled gardens, wanted yeah. to keep us there. Wanted to keep when you log in, you're, you're staying there. You are basically it, it, the difference is between like a shopping mall and a city where you can roam around and you can visit various stores. So they want to usher you into a mall and stay there. You have everything. You can food. You can look at the, the waterfall. You can gamble. You can shop. You can sleep. Blah blah. So. To me, single one problem that I originally had with SPAs was it, it was not bookmarkable and forwardable. Because mm -hmm. the original web, you can the, the whole thing is well, you can whatever resource you find you like it, you can bookmark it, you can forward to your friends. Yeah. Uh, how in the originally on Facebook and all this, you couldn't. You you just there like trapped in there, and it didn't behave like the web at all. It behaved like a desktop app, right? So I'm I'm wondering if that was also the driving force. Yeah. That, 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 right. 
Yeah, I, you know, it's easy to look. I'm, I, I always have to be careful because I, I can be prone to the, the sort of paranoid reading of history. Um, but uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, right? <laughs> so I think there, there may be something to that. Um, I, you know, my, my experience during that time was that a lot of the decisions were driven by hype and by being afraid of not being on the next thing. So it's, it's hard for me to, to differentiate if like there was a plan or if it was just the, the nature of computer programming, which tends towards this sort of, right. you know, but nevertheless, we, we, the new, new thing. You know, when you think about, uh, you, you find something you like, if it's a regular web, and I want to share with you, I can just send you forward you the URL, right? Yeah. Now, in Facebook, I like something, I find something I like, and I, I cannot forward it to you. I have to ask it, hey, Carson, can you yeah. join Facebook, log in, and we become friends? Then I can show you what I like. So it's, it's yeah. almost like recruiting medium in the early days. And yeah. I remember I, I joined Facebook because I've attended a huge uh, New Year's Eve party, and I took a lot yeah. of photos. And they emailed me saying, Alex, uh, we have great photos. I'm like, can you send it to me? Oh, it's all on Facebook. Well, I'm not on Facebook. Yeah. Well, just, just log in. I opened the account, and that's how I, I got uh, ro They got you. <laughs> yeah. They got you. <laughs> Again, sorry to interrupt, but I, you know, I, I yeah. felt that you couldn't forward any resources anymore. You, yeah. you have to become a member of the exclusive club, and now you're in there, and it's a wall garden, and it's like a shopping mall, and you're happy to be there. Yeah. And what's the point in going anywhere else? Like, just stay there. Everything yeah. is there. Yeah, and you know, and Apple does the same thing. Like they start hiding the nav bar and all this stuff. It's pretty for those of us that like the web and the way the web works. It can be a little infuriating at times. Um, but I think you know, I don't know. I believe in the cunning of reason, and like the it, these things tend to backfire. Like Facebook seems increasingly irrelevant to me. I don't know about the rest of the world, but um, yeah. So you know, these things. Uh, People have to do good work to make sure that these things don't happen. You know, and the big hullabaloo now is around Chrome's new uh, uh, pri privacy or uh, what do I want to say identification uh, technology. I forget the exact term that they have for it, um, but people are concerned about that. And I think that people are right to be concerned about it. But um, I've seen these things come and go. You know, you probably are old enough to remember when Microsoft was going to control the entire internet with internet explorer right like that was everyone was they completely oh, listen, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when microsoft thought that the future will be cd rom mm -hmm. <laughs> and they exactly. were batting big time like everybody will be yeah. buying cd roms and, and shoving them in and they're going yeah. and then one day yeah. bill gates walks into the uh, office and says drop whatever you're doing we are joining the internet yep yeah exactly and so i just you know i think you never know. You just never know. So, um, but uh, so in any event, that when when that happened, when that to, to get back to the main path here again, the um, there was a shift to single page applications and web development. And at that point, you know, again, I think I think that the, from the, for the end for the end developers, the developers that were actually building the applications, it was m mainly about the interactivity and the fact that you just couldn't achieve the same interactivity with the traditional form and link mechanism of the web that you could with a more JavaScript heavy approach. Can I, and I just can push I, can more and more yeah. Yeah. Sorry, of course. Uh, back in 2000, uh, sorry, uh, back in 1995, I got really excited about Java applets. Yeah, love Java applets, they were awesome. <laughs> so, you know, there was a way even back then without yeah. You know, to, to build interactivity if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. But, well, and when Fielding talked about code on demand in his uh, dissertation, that was he was thinking about applets. That's what he, he wasn't talking about JavaScript. Exactly. I think JavaScript was a big improvement on applets. Um, it just it, sorry, this is kind of inside baseball. But if you like the 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 problem that he cites with code on demand is that it decreases visibility, and JavaScript. Uh, helps with that because you, you can see the JavaScript, right? These days it's minified and horrifying and all the rest of it. And so it's impossible to understand, but but it, it was better than applets in some ways and that it, that visibility wasn't hurt. And I worked on another project called HyperScript that increases the visibility even more so 
um, in your in your hypermedia applications because you embed the scripting directly in your hypermedia. But um, so I think you know the, the, but I don't want to badmouth JavaScript here. Um, JavaScript, yeah. I mean, it's not my favorite programming language, but uh, it, it is there and it does work really well. I agree. It's um, light footed. You know, it's, it's light footed. Yeah. Yeah. Apples were a bit more heavy. You know, heavy ham fisted. Yeah, they were. You had to spin up a JVM and it couldn't interact with the DOM and all that. It was just crazy. So, um, but in any event, okay, back to the main path. Um, so people started writing the single page applications. And when they did that, they went to the JSON API style that's very popular today. And they, unfortunately, they kind of, that, that, when, when that happened, they lost the, they lost touch with the fundamental hypermedia roots of the web. Um, and that has persisted for a decade now to the point that a lot of young developers don't know anything about hypermedia. And so HTMX and this book, uh, Hypermedia Systems, are an attempt by me to get people reinterested in that idea by addressing, in particular, the usability issues, the, the UX issues that came with the older way of building with hypermedia. And so uh, the hope is that we can show you know younger engineers, hey, here's a way it can work. It doesn't have to be clunky. Uh, you can actually do some pretty cool stuff with it. And if you do that, you actually get some really nice advantages that come along with that with that approach. Um, and we'll we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so the first chapter kind of ends up with this, hey guys and gals, um, the you can use hypermedia and build modern web apps with it. You don't have to just have these clunky 2008 feel web apps with hypermedia. So you now have a choice, you know, and sometimes the hypermedia choice is a good one for a given application, and sometimes it's not a good one. It depends on the application. And so we try and give people some ways to decide between those two uh, possibilities. Um, and you can mix them as well, uh, d depending on the application needs. Um, but uh, the, the first chapter is really about convincing people, hey, there's something here. There's something worth knowing. Even if you don't use hypermedia for your particular application, um, it's still worth knowing and understanding what the uh, what 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 the terms are and and how the whole architecture works. Um, so that's chapter one. Um, chapter two, we talk about the components of the hypermedia, and in that chapter, I won't. I don't know. We can. We'll see how much you want to get into the weeds on it. But um, uh, we basically outline the, the the three components or the four components of a uh, hypermedia system, and they they boil down to uh, the hypermedia in question. So uh, HTML hypertext, um, then hypermedia protocols, which are network protocols that transmit hypermedia. So HTTP being the obvious one uh, with the web. Um, hypermedia servers, um, which really are not super complicated because hypermedia, is, or hypertext anyways, is fairly simple text transfer. Um, so pretty much any server can be a hypermedia server. There's nothing particularly special about it. Um, but then we talk a little bit about the hypermedia clients. And hypermedia clients, again, I've come to realize in the last year and a half or so, they're really special. They're a really special thing because um, they have to be able to understand the hypermedia in this uniform way. They have to be able to take that hypermedia response and render it or do something useful with it in a way where the, the, the uniform interface, which is part of REST, is, is respected. And so I've, I've really come to appreciate how much more difficult, how difficult that, that part of the hypermedia system is and how crucial it is, which is, in my opinion, one reason why, the, um, again, the, the, the uh, ideas of hypermedia have not translated particularly well into the JSON API world. Because, because you have to have both sides of the wire in this sort of hypermedia mindset or this, have this hypermedia uh, um, system established in order for it to be effective. Um, so we go through those and you know, talk about the details of HTTP and so forth just to give, again, kids who, kids, young, younger people, <laughs> people younger than me, anyways, um, a, uh, an introduction and a, or, or a reintroduction if they're already somewhat familiar with it to here are the concepts, here are the ideas, here's, there's no magic, you know, it's, it's just, it's just text and here's some headers and uh, you could, you know, write a server if you needed to. Um, and then the, the second part of chapter two talks about rest and the constraints of rest. Um, and I was a little conflicted with this because 
Um, I don't know. What's your take on Roy Fielding's dissertation? It was it was a massive document. Like it has a massive presence in early discussions of the web, and so I feel like you have to. <laughs> I feel like you have to understand it. Um, but I also have some misgivings about it. But I'd like to hear your take on it. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's overwhelming. Uh, I like to take some salient points that w work for me, yeah. and I'm not going to dwell on things that are too academic or whatever. Yeah, ha yeah. Hair brain. My yeah. my biggest and uh, uh, I'm enthused the most of all. I'm enthused by this. Um, how shall I call it? Piecemeal discovery of the capabilities. Mm -hmm. I I find that uh, this is the most powerful to me concept. That is presented. Yeah. I I find that a lot of teams struggle in the API world by having to know ahead of time entire capability, which are anyway volatile. And, and so yeah. here you are hardening you're, you're you're hardening a contract that is volatile and has every yeah. right to be volatile. And there is not, not right. there is no there is no bad feeling if the contract's broken because hey different businesses evolve at different pace and they should be free to evolve at whatever they consider is their advantage and right. so fielding's uh, approach is like that should never break anything yeah I mean, that's in insanely powerful this yep. flexibility that if i'm going to uh, avail myself of some capabilities out there and i'm either paying for it or it's free or whatever i should yeah. not be having trepidations oh, oh crap did am i using the right i hate versioning of the api i don't like that right why yep. because it's forcing me to maintain multiple versions of my product i don't mm -hmm. think that's engineering I, I think it's lousy and so to me rest that fielding defined is a, a liberation liberates you from that if indeed yep. we can follow that because now all of a sudden i have my own pace of evolution and i'm building my own capabilities i am also leveraging other capabilities, but I don't have to uh, make a career out of learning the intricate, all the details. I, I discovered them along the way. Yeah. And that's the hateus, right? And that's, yep. you know, I, I used, to, yesterday I used to uh, take advantage of this work beautifully. Today I'm going to, I want to do it again. Hey, something changed, nothing breaks. Yep. Hateus allows me to roll with the punches and say, because it's uh, in band, right? The in band mm -hmm. information is super powerful. I don't yeah. like any band because, hey, do I know even if the out of band, how reliable is out of band information? Maybe it's stale, right. but yeah. something that's live on the wire coming at me, I know it's the most recent. So I have yeah. no qual, I, I have no trepidation saying, oh my God, I mean, now I may try this and something blows up. No, it's right. a live system that keeps consistent and volatile. But we always yeah. pretend like there's a finite state and everything's done, bow tie, okay, done. Sadly, forget it, now it's working. No. We are living in incredibly, they call it the VUCA world, where it's like volatile and you know unpredictable, et cetera, et cetera. And so rather than pretending it's not like that and, and let's have a plan, to, a roadmap that ignores that, no, we should acknowledge it and roll yeah. with the pumps and, and engineer systems that allow us to keep functioning and yep. uh, honor honor other other sides ability to change to adapt yep. to grow right so that to me is the clincher that, that really yeah. bolts me over and i'm like okay i think this is phenomenal right yeah Regardless yeah of what, yeah i agree i think the unfortunately and it, the the irony of the situation is that the uniform interface which I think is, it's kind of what you're getting. It's not kind of, it is what you're getting at. Uniform interface constraint, and uh, sorry to back up for the listeners who aren't familiar with what we're talking about. Roy Fielding wrote a paper, a dissertation uh, paper um, that gave us the term REST and HADIOS, um, although he didn't use the acronym HADIOS. Um, and uh, in that paper, he, he was describing the web um, I see, and he was a participant in building a lot of the web, like the Apache web server and so forth. He was describing what it was and how it was different. And that paper was highly referenced early on in web development. It's not referenced nearly as much these days. Um, I, I, my opinion on the paper is that it's very academic. Um, and uh, chapter five, I think chapter two has some decent stuff in it. And chapter five really has some good stuff in it. But there's a lot of cruft in it as well. 
Um, and it, it also, I think, uh, it can lead people down. People can, I don't know, people just get a little too nerdy about it. Or I've seen a lot of arguments over uh, what I find to not be particularly relevant points or uh, certainly nothing is relevant. To me, the, the uniform interface is such a big idea that the rest of it, who cares? Like, yeah. who cares? Forest you know, and it's trees. Such a big, yeah, it's such a big idea. Um, so the, uh, this this paper, chapter five is the famous one. You can find it online and you can read through it. And he basically defines a series of constraints that a given network architecture has to satisfy in order to be considered restful. Um, and so I go through them in the book and talk about each one. One thing that's kind of funny is that there is one constraint, which is called the stateless constraint, um, which web apps, even in the olden days, uh, actually tend to violate because we, we uh, almost every web application system like framework has a notion of a session in it. Um, which is there's a from an HTTP standpoint, it looks stateless because it's a session cookie that goes back and forth. But there is typically server side state that's maintained against that session, at least a login if there's a login type system. And so it is ironic, I think, at some level that even Web 1.0 applications didn't really satisfy all of REST in some ways. And that you know that's fine. Um, uh, some of the problems he points out with violating that actually. Yeah. Still, I would say it is so uh, resilient and successful because of the statelessness. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 mostly stateless. It's mostly it's stateless. <laughs> right. If it uh, if it wasn't stateless, it will it will just blow up. Yeah, it, it's absolutely just too, too much to keep to keep yep. remembering at the same time. It, yep. it, it wouldn't exactly. be able. To, yeah. Yeah. So it's a the statelessness. I would say that's more of a goal rather, or it's it's an ideal. Um, but we do have to admit, I think that modern web apps don't uh, uh, completely satisfy that constraint. So there's a caching constraint. There's a layered system. There's a bunch of stuff that doesn't. Really, the big one in my mind is the uni uniform interface constraint. It gets it right exactly what you're talking about, which is this idea in a RESTful system that when a network response comes back, it contains within it uh, or it, the, the the content that comes back either contains or implies further network actions uh, uh, via, for, in, within that hypermedia response. And so the client doesn't need to know, you know, the example I always give is like a web browser doesn't care if you go to a bank website or a dog website, dog shop, you know, or pet shop. It's going to take the response and just show you here are the links you can click on. Here's the forms you can submit. It doesn't know what a dog is. It doesn't know what dog food is. It doesn't know what a bank account is. It doesn't know any of that stuff. Not all opinionated. The, the, it's not opinionated at all. It has a uniform interface, that ability to receive, interpret HTML, and display it, very importantly, display it to users um, in a meaningful way for those users. Um, uh, and, and then they can interact with that. And so you have one piece of software, this browser, this hypermedia client, that's a browser that can interact with any sort of backend. And that's a distributed system. You know, this is a distributed system. It's working over a network. And this same client can be talking to your news reader, to your bank, to your pet food store, to whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and, and work with all of those different servers, with all those different services, with all the different fundamental models that sit behind those things without knowing anything about it. And so that's really that uniform, when, when we say uniform interface, that's what we mean, is that there's this one uniform interface that this client can use to interact with all these different types of systems. And that was what was very unique about the web. And that is that is what is very unique about the web. Um, and uh, uh, very powerful, very resilient to change and, uh, and all the rest. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Um, and actually, I do mention Hadios and API term, which is what you were just talking about, which is one thing that's neat about the, the, the uniform interface is if your bank decides that a piece of functionality isn't going to exist anymore, or there's a new piece of functionality. When you go to your bank, you get that screen and the old functionality is gone and the new functionality is there. And that's it. And you interact with it. And you don't have a client like your you know, stupid bank uh, application on your phone that's suddenly broken because you can't do deposits because some service is gone. Instead, you've gotten the whole thing. You're seeing this is what I can do with this remote system. It's all right there. 
So uh, and, so things don't break. You know, when they, uh, just to interject, when they asked uh, Royal Fielding, how should we uh, version our API? His answer is yeah. like, don't. Yeah. Well, don't. you know, <laughs> there is a funny, there's a funny thing. Uh, there's, a, I, I link to it all the time from the essays page on htmx.org. Um, there's a, a quote from him. He wrote it like in 2008 where he was, he was saying, um, in order to be a RESTful API, you have to have hypermedia. Like hypermedia is a necessary constraint for a RESTful API. And he says, is there a manual somewhere that needs to be fixed? <laughs> and every time I read that line, I'm like, yeah, Roy, there sure is. It seems like you didn't communicate that idea very well, buddy. I think you wrote the manual. <laughs> he didn't set in. I don't know. I know. <laughs> but it's, it's I'm, all I'm good. To, I mean, from, from my experience, it, from the in the field, the bane of my existence are uh, those uh, API versioning and uh, yeah. having to maintain multiple versions of your product. It just that's not yeah. right. And I feel something's fundamentally broken. Right? Yeah, yeah. So chapter two really go, does a deep dive on on rest and on hadios and the uniform interface and so user like re, i guess listeners or watchers or whatever but, uh, listeners who are interested in that can go and that's I, I i try to boil down what in my opinion is the most important concepts i touch on everything but i boil down and really focus on the, the important concept of the uniform interface there um and then there is a there there's an optional constraint someone somewhat awkwardly tacked on to the end that we talked about earlier when we were talking about java applets which is this idea of code on demand which is the idea that a, a system should be able a, a restful system should, uh, is allowed to although not uh, required to it's an optional constraint is allowed to provide code on demand or, or a, a, a executable logic that can be downloaded um, and at the time when he was writing i think the main thing in people's heads uh, were java applets um, but javascript has since taken the place of that um, as the, the the primary way to deliver code on demand and so one thing people often say oh you just say javascript and it's true i'm not a huge javascript fan uh, the language has many issues i'm not you know i'm not super excited about but um but it is uh, uh, scripting is part of the web, and it should be part of the web, right? in my opinion. I, I, I think scripting is a good thing because HTML isn't complete, you know, uh, and uh, uh, the ability to provide scripting to enhance that uh, is a good thing. I just think it should be done in such a way that it complements rather than replaces the, the fundamental hypermedia architecture. So the way JavaScript is used today very often just completely replaces hypermedia and uses more of a thick client approach. Um, and so my my position is, and not that that's always wrong, but um, you can use the hypermedia approach uh, more frequently than most people suspect, especially something like HTMX. And, and then scripting is fine. It just needs to be done in a certain way. It shouldn't be making network calls. It should be used to enhance the hypermedia as hypermedia. So so those are, that's, the, that's chapter two. Uh, I guess in a nutshell, um, but uh, anyone who's in interested can go read the details on that. Um, and then, uh, so uh, do you have any any comments before I move on to chapter three? Do you want, is there anything you wanted to say? No, it's really good. Uh, uh, thank you for distilling it in, in this way. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's going to be fully understandable to everyone. There's no, I don't think we didn't didn't leave any residue of like, what do you mean by this and that? It's, it's sure. really common sense and you know i think everybody should be able to follow so that's yeah, a nice good. summary please move on to the chapter three okay so chapter three is a web 1.0 application and that's where we get more practical so the first two chapters are a little bit more conceptual like hey here's the theory behind hypermedia systems yeah uh, chapter three is really okay let's get down to brass tacks and let's build a web application and it's a we so we end up building a simple web application in Flask, which is a Python web framework. Um, and it was very difficult to pick Flask um, because the Django community has was really the first community to jump on the HTMX bandwagon. And they've been just absolutely wonderful. Um, I've gotten you know to know a lot of the people in that community. It's a great community. Um, but Django is a is, is a very heavy, it's a it's a batteries included framework. Um, and the problem with batteries included frameworks is that they are often make it difficult to see the connection between, for example, a web request and a bit of logic. 
Um, and uh, so I, I decided uh, to use Flask instead. And Flask is a very, very lightweight uh, web, basically just a web framework. Um, it doesn't do any database stuff. You have to bring BYO everything <laughs> um, uh, if you're going to work with it. But what Flask is really good at is tying a web request to a bit of Python logic. And so I ended up using Flask for that. And my hope is that Flask is simple enough that people can look at the Flask examples and do a fairly easy translation into whatever web framework they like. Um, one thing that we, you know, one, one thing we really want to emphasize with HTMX is that uh, it can be used with any backend. There's no particular technology that HTMX prefers. Um, so if you want to use JavaScript on your backend, hey man, all good. Uh, if you want to use Java, if you want to use C Sharp, if you want to use OCaml, if you want to use Python, if you want to use Go, uh, Haskell, Lisp, like whatever, that's all all good. HTMX is backend agnostic, and you should be able to use any of those. Um, we don't have any, you know, I've got my preferred programming languages, but I don't want anyone to feel like they can't use HTMX because of their preferred programming language. Um, uh, so, uh, so again, by picking Flask, I hoped to create examples that would be easy to translate into other programming languages and other web frameworks using Python. Um, so, uh, and we go through effectively, and we build out a pretty simple contact application. So the ability to just in a web 1.0 way using just forms and links, here's a table of contacts and here's a button or a link to go to an ad form. And that ad form has a couple of fields for the fields that are necessary for a contact. You fill them in, you click save. It does the post, the big page refresh, the big chunk and blah, 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 uh, redirects. And sure enough, you go back to your table and there's a new entry in the, um, uh, in the screen. And I think this is a really valuable chapter. I'm not gonna go through the details of it here, um, but I think it's a really valuable chapter, particularly for younger people who have never built a web 1.0 style application um, to just go through the exercise of building a web app this way. Um, in order to see, oh, this is just to take the magic out of it. You know, I think, you, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm just re referring back to our uh, first conversation, which was uh, in July 2021. Ugh. Where you, <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, I can send you the link. You advocate, Ooh. which I really liked. You, you were back then uh, advocating returning to full stack. Yeah and abandoning this charade with like front end back end and i think that's what yeah. this exercise is really good for to for people to realize yes i must be full stack for various reasons even security involved and everything you talked about these things a lot and i really liked the previous conversation you really nailed it uh, on that yeah. front yeah that's right um this you know there is there's a sense of unity or uh, i don't know what the right term is completeness where if you can control both the front end and the back end of the application, you can make a, a screen do a thing. You don't have to rely on someone else to get something right, you know? Um, and so uh, the, the, uh, the early web, we, we did, we were full stack developers, not necessarily great at design. There were designers that did the design, um, but we were, you know, responsible for both the HTML as well as the logic backing the HTML for the most part. Um, and there is sort of a, a sense of completeness to that, that uh, in my experience, you don't get when there's this hard front end back end split um, that you see with the single page application setup. Um, so, you know, obviously there are people that do do both sides of the wire in SBAs, solo devs or whatever. Um, but uh, increasingly you see teams split up. And as soon as you have teams, I mean, it's bad enough if you have two people, but if you have two teams with two PMs that are doing prioritization and all the rest of it, forget about it, right? Like you, the, the, the amount of, of friction there is just massive compared to one person owning an entire feature and being able to optimize across the front end and the back end, um, which is something that, you know, we were used to. That's the way it used to be in the old, olden days, um, you know, as clunky as things were, you could take a page and say, okay, this page is allowed to make three queries and that's it. And so I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna get the SQL queries right. Uh, you know, I'll use SQL cause I'm not afraid of it. Um, 
and I'm going to get the SQL queries right. And uh, sure enough, I'm able to get it done in three queries. And this response is in like, you know, six milliseconds. And it's going to feel great to the end user. And that's something that's very hard to do when you're talking through a, an abstract pipe like a JSON API with like GraphQL or whatever on, on top of it. Hey, this thing's taking too long. Okay, what's your query look like? We'll get to it. We got to do this. I don't know. Did you try that? Like that whole back and forth. Now, none of that. Just, you know, you have this uh, uh, complete feature and you get it done. It's a very productive way of building web applications. And so uh, this chapter, again, I think for, for especially for people that haven't done uh, a web 1.0 style application before is really good reading to just see, OK, this is how, there's nothing magic here. <laughs> the server side is not magic. These, these server-side engineers are not, <laughs> there's nothing special about them. If you can figure out React on the client side, I assure you, you can figure out SQL and like rendering templates on the server side <laughs> because the client side is so crazy now that the idea that there's any difference complexity-wise between the two is not, it's just not tenable anymore. Um, so don't be afraid of it, you know, don't be afraid of it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think it mostly, you know, also good for more senior developers to review and just understand, hey, you know, this is how it works in Flask. If you've never seen Flask, if you, if you know Flask well, you'll just blast through it and say, oh yeah, obvious, obvious, obvious. But um, nonetheless, it does go through all those things. It does point out some problems. Uh, you know, one classic problem with HTML that I like to talk about is the fact that uh, as it stands today, you can only issue gets and posts with HTML. So uh, there's also, you know, patch, put, and delete, three other HTTP actions. And HTTP was designed to transfer HTML. That's what it was designed to do. Uh, but there are these three things that you, three actions that you can't uh, use unless you actually kick out to JavaScript to use them, which is somewhat how, ironic. How illegal do you think would it be to just piggyback on post and do updates and deletes? I don't think it's, I don't think it's that bad. Um, you know, in my mind, it's more of a, a yeah, the, at the end of the day, the difference between post and put and patch, like there's semantic, this is the kind of stuff that people argue about on the internet. And I just start rolling my, eyes. like it's damaging to the cause of rest for you guys to argue about this stuff. In my mind, my mind post means I'm changing the state of the server. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like and so I think it's more of a it's more of an aesthetic criticism than anything. It's just like, man, that's dumb. <laughs> that just doesn't. That just is stupid. <laughs> so we need to fix that. Um, and in HTMX, we do fix that. So, uh, but I agree. At some level, like when you get down to brass tacks and what's what's viable. I mean, the difference between a post and a get is the post body you know encodes in its body the content typically. And I know that content can be much larger. And so, like, the, you know, there's no reason why patch is, is superior to it. I actually learned recently delete is not supposed to have a body. I thought delete was like post where uh, you just had a body. And so HTMX actually was wrong. Um, it includes stuff in the body of a delete by default, but that's actually not the stack, um, but, which I think is a mistake. But, but going back quickly to REST, which yeah. you explained, but uh, I think we should also spell out uh, the acronym, right? Oh, Repres yeah. Rep representational state transfer is what so REST. It's very significant because we need to point out that uh, according to that philosophy, at least my understanding, and correct me if you disagree, yeah. it's uh, uh, the web is a collection of resources. Yep. And uh, in actuality, we never get to see nor touch a resource. We are only dealing with the representation of the resource. Yeah. And a single resource can have more than one representation. Sure. Uh, and so we, we, when we're interacting with it, let's say I, I, I'm seeing a resource. Let's say I, I posted something or something, and I send a delete uh, instruction. I don't know if it's really has been deleted or I'm just getting the representation that it's been deleted. Right. There's no way for me to know that. Yeah. It's uh, it's an affair, intimate affair behind the scenes, how they want yeah. to do it. Maybe, maybe they yep. just didn't delete it. And there's nothing I can do to enforce that, right? It's right. similar to when, when they say, okay, we, we, we're not going to uh, abuse your personal data. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure you're not. <laughs> yeah, right. so that, to me, that's also a powerful concept of REST is that represent yeah. the, the resources, you, you never touch a raw resource. You, you never actually yeah. touch it. 
see. You, all you're yep. dealing with is representation. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I also think that's why, you know, people who are older web developers are so passionate about URLs, you know? When people are like, oh, we'll hide the navigation bar. I start, like, I get angry. No, that's the, that's the, that's the thing that points to the resource that I want to send to somebody. Why would you take that away from me? Oh, it's too nerdy. No, it's not. Grandma sent me links to pictures back in the day. She can figure out how to copy and paste. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the, the idea of resources is very powerful, you know, and um, there are, it does introduce some weird stuff. Like, you know, when you start thinking about a more of a RPC style operation, like how do I tell a mailing list, send a mail? Do I post the mailing list slash ID slash send probably? Like, does that, is that a resource? Well, it does a redirect, I don't know. Um, so it does get a little just kind of fuzzy around the edges, but the, the general concept I think is very powerful. And uh, uh, it, it is, uh, the especially like that bookmarkability of resources is something that would be an absolute disaster in my mind if that just went away with the younger generation. So, um, so in any event, that chapter really uh, walks, chapter three really walks you through building a web 1.0 application. Um, and just sort of the, the the language that's used when building uh, <clears throat> those style that that sort of an application as well. So very useful, I think, for younger people. Um, and that leads into the the fourth chapter, which is um, a little it's a little philosophical. It's basically why I built HTMX. Um, and uh, so HTMX, the idea with it was okay. Let's generalize HTML. Let's take these. Let's let's try and find a way. For HTML to become powerful enough that you don't have to go over to JavaScript to achieve these sorts of user interfaces, and so there, you know, there were there were there were kind of four areas that we that I identified, and this is all this is all backfilled. It's not like I sat down and wrote a paper out and was like, here's the four areas. <laughs> this is just I realized after I had done most of this work, oh, this is what I was trying to, to solve. So I don't want to say like, you know, I wrote down on a piece of paper and then was like, okay, I'm gonna fix each of these. But this is just when I go back and look at what actually happened. In my mind, this is what the conceptual, this is the platonic thing that was sitting on top of the messy real world. Uh, uh, history of this library. Um, but basically the idea is, okay, why should only anchors and forms be able to issue requests? Uh, I know some people disagree strongly with that. They think only anchors and forms uh, should be able to issue requests. Those people usually think buttons should be able to issue requests too. Um, and buttons can't unless they're in a form. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I recognize that's a controversial statement. Um, why should only clicks and submits uh, issue requests, and if you look at uh, JavaScript, it's often not, you know, interactions are often not driven via only clicks and submits. Uh, why are only gets and posts available? Um, so get re HTTP requests and posts. Uh, HTTP requests are the only ones that are available in HTTP or in HTML, I should say, by default. You have to use JavaScript to get access to these other types of requests. Um, and again, I agree with you that that's at some level an aesthetic criticism more than a like a technical limitation. Um, and then the big one is why should uh, uh, hypermedia interactions have to replace the entire screen? And that really is the crux, I think. Or not, I don't want I don't want to say the crux, but that's one of the the. the it's probably the biggest of these four opportunities for improvement. Um, the, the old way the web worked was you issued an HTTP request, you got back an entire new document and it was loaded into the screen and there was this flash and like you lost your scroll state and all this crazy stuff. And so by, by doing away with that, by saying, okay, instead of replacing the whole screen, let's take this response and let's just stick it somewhere in the existing screen, suddenly you can keep your scroll state, you can keep everything nice and tidy in the way you want it. And uh, you can get a much more interactive feel um, from your uh, web application, even though you're still using hypermedia. Um, it's, it's a little funny because this concept had been around for a while. Um, the, the concept of what's called transclusion had been discussed quite a bit in hypermedia. It, a lot of these discussions got got muddied by like when people talked about transclusion, they were often talking about taking one website and merging its content into another website. And so there, there I think that that muddied the water around uh, that discussion or, or in that discussion. And so it's unfortunate that it really hasn't, uh, it, you know, in my mind, a lot of this stuff would be in HTML today if the discussions hadn't 
just gone wandered off in so many different directions. So um, in any way, we outline those four different opportunities and then HTMX basically addresses each one of them. And so we go through and say, here's how HTMX addresses the fact that only anchors and forms can issue requests. You can put the, an attribute like HX get on anything. You put it on a button directly um, and that'll issue when it's clicked on, that'll issue a, a, a get request to whatever URL you specify. Um, you can specify HX trigger and you can listen for any event. And then there's a fairly sophisticated syntax for filtering events and you know when when exactly you want things to occur. Um, uh, but any you know that that can trigger uh, uh, any event now can trigger a request. And then there's a bunch of different attributes. So you have, for example, HX delete. If you want to issue a delete request, you no longer have to only issue gets and posts. There are a few different attributes to let you uh, um, issue different types of requests. And then for the final big thing that HTMX takes advantage of is, is that last idea where you can set an HX target attribute and you can basically point to anywhere on the screen that you want to replace using a CSS selector. You can say, okay, when I get a response back, from the server, I want you to take that response and I want you to stick it here in the DOM. I want you to replace the inner HTML of this or the outer or whatever. There's a bunch of different ways you can specify to, to replace stuff. Um, but uh, it, the chapter walks you through how HTMX addresses each one of those issues. And uh, and just just using HTML, um, you're able to build a much more interactive, uh, a much more interactive uh, application. Um, so we go through that and then we talk a little bit about like just there's a lot of practical considerations um so how do you pass parameters from a form for example to the server side and how does history support work and so forth um so kind of more into the muck of uh, of htmx than i think we want to get but this chapter does start with a kind of high level like what is a hyperlink like what does a hyperlink mean when a browser sees a hyperlink what is it what is it see sees an anchor sees a you know an anchor tag and it's got some text inside of it and then it's got an href or a hypermedia reference and so the browser's job is to say okay i don't know anything about what that text is <laughs> i don't know what this thing points to could be pointing to a bank could be pointing to a dog food store could be pointing to anything but i do know there's some text i'm going to take that text i'm going to underline it and I'm gonna show it on a screen. And if a user clicks on that thing, I'm gonna issue an HTTP get to the URL that's in that hypermedia reference. And then whatever that is, I'm gonna stick that into the screen. I don't know anything about anything, guys. All I know is, all I know is that uh, this is how I should present uh, a, uh, an anchor to, uh, do you to, ever, to an anchor. Yeah, do you ever touch upon the rel attribute? The, no, not at all. I probably should, I don't. Um, uh, which is a way to specify exactly like it's, it's meta information about the link, right? It's it's a way to specify meta information. I've never used it successfully, and so <laughs> I didn't talk about it at all. Um, but I probably should have. Um, so, but in any event, that's chapter four. And chapter four is sort of the first half. I think is that conceptual idea of how do we get to HTMX, and then the second half is like, and here's some of the details. Um, of, of, at a high level if you want to understand how HTMX works effectively. And so then from that point on in the book, chapters five through, hold on one second, make sure I get this right, chapters, um, yeah, so chapters five through uh, eight, um, I, we go through and what we do is we improve the web application. We have this existing web 1.0 application and we take techniques and it, available in HTMX and we use it to just improve that application like hey let's make it so you don't have to go you know you don't have to do a full page refresh when you do all this stuff and uh, so we go through you know and just show for example like active search so as a user is typing in a small text box it filters down the context uh, below it sort of uh, on the fly um, things that most people would expect would require a single page application style application to achieve. Um, and so that's very good, I think, if you wanna get into HTMX and you wanna learn about the details. Um, we do talk, we have chapter nine is on client-side scripting and that kind of gives people our take on how client-side scripting should work um, in a hypermedia driven application, which is the term we use for applications. We use hypermedia to, uh, 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 to work rather than JSON. Uh, and then chapter 10 is on JSON data APIs. 
So we, you know, our position, my position, um, should probably shouldn't speak for the other authors, but my position is that JSON data APIs aren't bad. They just have a particular application. Like if you want to integrate with a third party system, that third party system, or if you want other people to integrate with your system, then fine, produce a JSON API. But that JSON API has a very has very different characteristics than your hypermedia system and your hypermedia based web application. Um, it needs to be very stable. You need to version it, all this other stuff needs to be very general. Um, whereas your hypermedia API is, is tuned for your particular application. Like when you have an endpoint for a particular screen in your application, um, that endpoint is tuned for your web app. It's, it's, it's not general at all. It's very specific and that's the power. And then you can change it however you want because of this discoverability aspect of the uni uh, uniform interface. So we have effectively in that chapter, we advocate splitting your JSON API and your, uh, uh, and your uh, hypermedia API up into two separate things and then fine. Now just let them, you know, do their own things. Um, so that's, that's through chapter 10. And then there, uh, the, the next three chapters are on uh, on Hyperview, which is a mobile hypermedia, and that's what Adam Stepinski, uh, that's his creation, and that's what uh, he wrote those three chapters. And it basically takes the web app that we built and says, how would we build this for a mobile application using uh, Hyperview? And uh, so with Hyperview, you've got it's it's a it's a hypermedia, but uh, very importantly, Adam also provides you with a hypermedia client for that hypermedia. And so you can actually, uh, boy, I'm not gonna do it anywhere near the justice it deserves, but if you build a mobile application with Hyperview, you can ship that to a client or you can publish that to, a, to an app store. You can publish it to an app store. You can up, because it uses Hypermedia exchanges, you still have swiping and all the, the native hypermedia or the native mobile functionality, but because it uses a hypermedia that's tuned specifically for mobile to communicate with the backend server, you can update your web app or your mobile application without going back to the to the store, to that mobile store. You don't need how to update it. How is that different from progressive web apps? It's okay. Your... Yeah. So how's it different? That's a great question. And the difference is that uh, hyper uh, hyper view has much deeper native mobile support than uh, PWAs do. So you have like swiping support and all the, all, like all that native stuff that makes web apps not feel, for certain applications, obviously there's a lot of places where progressive web apps are great and they're fine. You don't need more than that. But when you do need more than that, when you need a real native mobile experience, Hyperview gives you the ability to have that native experience, but then still retain the advantages of the web-based model where you can just update your server, all your clients get the new version of your, your application. You don't have to go out and submit it for approval and then hope that everyone upgrades and you've got two different you, versions of your API. Does it also allow the try before you buy like PWAs do or you have to? <clears throat> Um, I think that's it's like it's a framework and you can build that however you want on top of it. Okay. Like you can you can it's it's just a framework. He provides you a client, you bundle that client and put it up in gotcha. the app store. But what you do on top of it is yeah, yours. One problem with uh, native apps is I cannot try, I have to download and install before I can try. Yeah. Yeah. And, then and so that that is ten, nine that out of is ten the case with like this. <laughs> right. So yeah. it's yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it is. It is in that sense. It does feel like a native, uh, native application. But you, as a developer, as you're updating your system, you don't have to go through this whole like uh, submitting to get it approved and then hoping it gets pushed out yeah. and all that stuff. Instead, it's just like with the web. One of the great things about a web app is you deploy a new version and the new version's out. No one's using the old version anymore because it's gone. The new version yeah, is there. And so with uh, with Hyperview, you get that uh, that. Uh, that same really, really nice uh, experience uh, without having to deal with, you know, without having to deal with the app stores. Um, so he goes through that. It's, you know, again, I think at some level, the hypermedia that he built an entire hypermedia system. With HTMX, we just took advantage of the existing hypermedia. We just en enhanced the existing hypermedia system. Um, Adam really built from scratch his own 
hypermedia system in the form of Hyperview. And uh, so I really applaud what he has achieved there. I think those three chapters uh, show, you know, very, very effectively uh, how, how that can work for you. Um, so that's chapters 11 through 13. And then chapter 14 is just a conclusion where, you know, I, I kind of wrap things up and then, and then say, hey, you know, hopefully this has inspired you to at least to take a deeper look at hypermedia and to not just abandon this just because it seems like it's old and gronky or whatever. It's not cool. Um, there are some really neat ideas here, some neat ideas that we've that we've lost. And a lot of the problems that people bitch about today are addressed by this older technology. You know, when you hear people complaining about JavaScript fatigue, API versioning, headaches, and so forth, it's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> there was a technology that solved a lot of this stuff. And there are problems with it. It's just like anything else. There are trade-offs. Um, there, so there are trade-offs associated with hypermedia, but HTMX does a lot to ameliorate those trade-offs. Um, and in many cases, you can build a web app using just hypermedia. Um, there's a good link off the, if you go to the htmx.org slash essays, there's a real world port from React to HTMX. And the numbers, they, they, they do, there's a whole talk on it. And the numbers that they uh, came up with or that they saw afterwards are really, let me bring them up real quick here, um, which I can do because I'm on the open internet. Um, hold on, what is it? Uh, a real world React to HTMX port. Yeah, so um, they ported from a big React setup to an HTMX setup and they reduced their code base size by 67%. They went from 21,000 lines of code to 7,000 lines of code. I mean, just like that, just that alone, right? <laughs> it's like, holy smokes. Um, they, they ended up writing a lot more logic in Python, which is what they wanted to do because they were a Python shop. They reduced their JS dependencies, JavaScript dependencies, nightmare, went down by 96% from 255 libraries to nine. Um, their build time went down by 88%. Their memory usage went down by 46%, um, and their first time to interactive went down by 50 to 60%. Um, so, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you can't do it the hypermedia way because it doesn't perform. It'll, you know, and it's, you know, that's it, true in some cases, but not, not all, and maybe not even most. Um, well, the hypermedia also, approach is very, very effective for a lot of styles of web applications. And also one thing we did not get the chance to discuss, I will just briefly mention here, is uh, one of the biggest problems with this split into front end, back end, is uh, maintaining duplicate logic. Yep. Uh, and I see that I see that a lot. So the same logic that governs the business policy rules on the back end are now replicated on the front end, and before you know it, things go out of whack. Yep. And then yeah. bugs start appearing. Right. This is really not good engineering, no yeah. matter how you put it. Yeah. Uh, a single source of truth is a big, uh, beefy concept that we should respect. As yeah, much as absolutely. we yeah. maintain yeah. single source of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, you really have two options there, right? When it comes to, you can either, you can either say, if you, well, we'll do everything in JavaScript then, right? Like you can uh -huh. say that, like we're going to do everything in JavaScript, which I don't think that's a good choice. I don't want my bank software written in JavaScript myself. I don't know about you, but I don't want it written in JavaScript. I know how numbers behave in JavaScript. No, so thank you. Um, uh, or yeah, as you said, you have to duplicate your logic. And so why why have that be the choices? Why not use hypermedia, keep everything on the server side in an environment that you understand and you control tightly versus the browser where it's you know wild, wild west. Anybody can do anything. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, um, and you're going to have to redo the, the validations on the server side anyways, because you can't trust validations that are done on the exactly. client side. Um, so so a, a ton of really good arguments for hypermedia. And I think, you know, I've been just kind of overwhelmed, to be totally honest, with the way the last month and a half has gone since, uh, first of all, the Primagen guy <laughs> picked it up and then uh, uh, the um, Fireship dev. Uh, did a did a thing on uh, HTMX and it just like I mean talk about blowing up in my face. I've always been pretty silly on Twitter, and then suddenly now like twice as many people are looking at me, and it's a little scary. A little scary. <laughs> but, no, it's uh, fantastic. But it's good. Hey, can I can I quickly 
and th this may be out of uh, necessary topic. I, I just want to quickly go back to uh, the old school and just yeah. mention two things. Well, one thing I liked about the original web is this idea of a mashup. Mm. You probably remember the days of mashups. Yeah. Sure. They're gone. Nobody talks about that anymore. I, I thought yeah. it's a neat thing. I really enjoyed it. But yeah. it, it, it. These are the days before we were so uptight about copyright and that. You know, we were just yeah. really sharing and enjoying the world. So that's one thing that I don't see anymore. And and probably, you know, HTMX could easily be make it even more powerful. Another, just a question for you, something I'd never liked and, and I never practiced, but a lot of people to this day I see is the iframes. Yeah. What's your take on that? Um, I think iframes are, uh, you know, they're kind of a kludge uh, and they, they're they not, they don't have very, people today talk about DX, developer experience. Uh -huh. um, I think iframes have bad DX. They're good in the sense that they, they sandbox uh, things, but uh, it makes it very hard to achieve uh, achieve uh, what you want in an app because they just can't talk to one yeah. another, you know. And uh, so uh, I've I've used iframes in places uh, when it was just necessary. And there's actually a messaging mechanism you can use to get transmit messages between iframes yeah. and parents. Um, but it was all it was always pretty difficult when compared with just normal HTML authoring. Um, so my take on iframes is they are a necessary evil at times. Um, they've been abused pretty badly. Um, but I think I think transclusion and smooth transclusion is a better way to do things the way HTMX works. And uh, so, yeah, but I, don't, I mean, you know, I've used them at times. I often feel they're like a cop out. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, but I don't know from the UX perspective. I also I'm not the, too keen on as a user. Yeah, they they look wrong. They don't look right. I'm, there I'm used to not. be similar. There used to be similar. Like I don't know. You remember back in the day, you could do embedded uh, com objects. Like you could uh -huh, just yeah. embed like a a spreadsheet in your application, yeah. right? Yeah. And it had that same like, why is there this weird spreadsheet in the middle of my? Yeah. It just doesn't feel right. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I think you'd be better off doing that integration that you're trying to achieve on the front end, on the back end, and then providing a hypermedia API that, that integrates yeah. that. Do that work on the back end is what I would say in an ideal world. That's not always possible, but um, that's yeah. probably the way I would talk about it. I, yeah, I agree. Makes sense. So since both you and I are big fans of the web and uh, this whole, how you, mm. what you want to call it, uh, the liberation and you know open-mindedness and kind of unlimited growth. If I may ask you, uh, I'm looking at some further breakthroughs that are kind mm. of happening on the one. One is what uh, people refer to as edge computing. Sure. Um, don't know really. You know, basically the prediction is that every man-made object will be a data center. And. Okay. Uh, so that kind of flies, uh, you know, in against the grain of the web, right? Because it's all of a sudden not a system; it's uh, it's an isolated component, and to function properly, it needs all the knowledge located right there, like self-driving yeah. car, like you know, because of the inherent network latencies, you, you cannot risk it and chance it. Right. The cars to ask right, what I do now, and you know, and. So that that's one thing that may disrupt our love affair with the web. I don't know how that's going to play out, right? No idea. Yeah. Um, do you have any any kind of insight I've, into that? Or? I've I've been skeptical of uh, edge computing because to me the computing part isn't the hard part. The hard part is data synchronization, and so this seems to me like it pushes that you know you push the data out to the edge and that's fine, but now you got to sync it somewhere. Um, and so I, you know, like one thing I really what, you know, one thing that, uh, I really liked about the web two, two things that sort of happened. One was that, um, you didn't, you had, you had one database and so you committed and it was done and that was it. And if someone else came in, you typically used, uh, optimistic concurrency. And if they were unable to update, they got a message saying, Hey, we weren't able to update that. And they knew right away, you know, you knew if your thing saved or not. 
Um, when you start getting into distributed data stores and like async updates, then someone clicks save and someone clicks save and both systems are like, hey, great. And then only later do you find out, oh no, that person won and this person now is out of luck. Um, and so I think a, a single data store really simplifies development quite a bit. And once you have that single data store, I, I, I don't know how much of an advantage you get pushing the computation out to these edge nodes because they still have the network latency to the single data store. Um, so I, you know, it's not something that I've really wished for most of the apps I've built, like, man, if I had edge computing, this would be a ton easier. Um, I think there's a little bit of overlap with like the microservice craze, which in my mind is a little crazy um, because chopping your, not that you shouldn't chop your system up into operational bits, but if you do it too fine grain a level, it ends up becoming a, a, a real morass to deal with, in my opinion. Um, and it, you know, you, start, you end up committing to particular abstractions because this thing is here and that's it. <laughs> like I can't refactor it and you know, you know, tear it out if I you know don't like it anymore because I don't know what's using that service. Um, so, uh, so he, I'm, I don't want to say I'm I'm negative on on edge uh -huh, computing, uh -huh. but but I'm I'm lukewarm on it for my, for my work anyways. I don't, right. see a lot of I don't see a lot of places where it would be a huge advantage for me. Because one uh, one prediction, and you know, these things are very crazy, but uh, we have built a world today where it's basically the world of screens. Yeah. We have nothing but screens. Yeah. Uh, and some people feel that that's very limiting. The re sure. rectangular, rectangular glassy surface. You cannot... Yeah reduce human experience to a flat rectangular glassy surface but that's what right. we're doing i mean yeah. you, you, you i hop in an uber uh, driving tesla this big screen the guy is driving by looking at the screen <laughs> i'm like can you <laughs> yes. I, I feel uncomfortable here do it can you keep an eye on the road anyway um there, there could be a uh, um some kind of a t turning of the tables potentially where we want sure. to go back into the three-dimensional world and engage with all our faculties rather than just yep. uh, uh, eyesight. Sure. Right now we are much eyesight. We're just looking at things. Yep. So, yeah. 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 You know, I think the the the, the AR stuff is coming and it's going to change things a little bit. Um, you know, I'm I'm I tend to be skeptical. Um, I I I think you know. If you go back and you look, for example, we talk about, oh, you know, you're doing 3D navigation. There's, and not that that's not important, but double entry bookkeeping <laughs> is what makes the world go round. And that is a two dimensional <laughs> sheet of paper or yeah. screen or whatever. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of stuff that will still be best served with yeah. integer integer computing and two-dimensional screens <laughs> uh, i think the, the the thing we are missing is for example it wasn't that long ago if you were an architect i mean real architect you know, software right. or some kind of engineer you were making the uh replicas of the objects like toy size right and then we'd be yeah. you would be touching them it, it's tactile right you're, you're picking sure. them up moving them around yep. and now this has disappeared and we are just looking at the screen and we are pretending that you know so some people feel that we have lost something by yeah going that convenient path of least resistance that yep. some knowledge or some capability has been sacrificed at the altar yeah. of convenience yeah, yeah. Uh, so possibly i, I definitely yeah. agree with that when you talk about mechanical stuff and yeah. physical stuff for sure yeah another thing is that uh you know I'm, I'm always like a little bit of a pioneer so back in 2016 i i kind of bet my i, I started a business and I, I you know they say pioneers are people who are lying down with the arrow in their backs right yeah <laughs> but sure. I, I at that point i felt like hmm maybe uh screens are good for consuming but not so good for interacting so i thought maybe yep. uh talking mm. and, and, and chatting will be the new uh, UX, right? Yep. Of course, it was too early, but uh, again, uh, we're seeing re re resurrecting with chat GPT and all that, where 
Yeah. You can get a lot of accomplished if you can just talk to Chat GPT and it can go and do a yeah. lot of shit for you. <laughs> it's, yeah. Especially now with the COVID uh, interpreter, you can do yep. amazing shit, right? I don't know if you played with yeah. it, but I have not, not, but oh my god. I've seen I've seen some really good demos of it. And I think um, you know, one one criticism or one one of my early comments, I don't want to say criticism, one of my early comments on hypermedia was that the uniform interface to be consumed effectively. You have a you have a hypermedia client and that hypermedia client presents options to a user, right? But then the human user has to select what they want to do. Yeah. And the crucial thing there is want, right? Like the human is has agency and can decide I want to make a deposit or I want to do a thing or whatever. And so my, my criticism, and there's an essay uh, called Hadios is for humans, is that humans provide the agency that is necessary for a good hypermedia system to work effectively. And that's wasted on just dumb code that cannot decide what it wants to do. And so I'm not too deep in the AI world. I'm not an AI guy. Um, but in as much as AI is able to provide agents that do want to do things, security issues and <laughs> moral issues and all that aside, I wonder if hypermedia might be more uh, interestingly applied in, a, in an automated environment than it has been so far. Um, because yeah. that really, to me, is the crux about in a hypermedia system, you've got a server that knows what it wants to show, You've got a hypermedia client that knows how to show it, but doesn't know what any of it means. And you've got a human looking at it on a screen or whatever. It's like, okay, I'm going to select that action because I want to do it. And so, uh, and as much as as as, uh, as agency is emerging from uh, the, the, this research, then uh, I think that there might be some interesting applications with hypermedia. Yeah, I agree. My back in 2016 when I launched that business, my uh, motto or mantra however you want to call it was the web is the the web is programmable information and this new world is programmable workforce mm. where uh you know i was hoping that we can regular guys like you and i can just get and program the whole bunch of those uh, workers who can go and do stuff for us right mm -hmm. uh almost i'm envisioning that, that almost like if you're rich and you hire staff right you hire you, you hire gardeners and all that and you tell them what you want them to do yeah you don't necessarily have to hold their hand and like do it you know step by right. step you say hey make this garden beautiful and i want tonight an awesome dinner and i want you know blah blah, blah. <laughs> right. so you know it, it, it historically it's just the privilege of super rich but yeah. at, at, uh, advanced sophisticated technology can give us some of that uh for much less yeah much lower. But th sure. this is like sci-fi, right? But yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm I'm trying to tie that into hypermedia and all that. Yeah. Uh, sorry to go philosophical on that, but no, no, it's good. I, I just I have a very since I don't understand AI very well, and uh, I, I just you know, and I, I I know hypermedia pretty well. I try and take it back, and that's the that's the real cut point that I see here. That's the real yeah. point yeah. of focus in a hypermedia system that makes you know. And I I go back again to the JSON. API engineers who have largely rejected REST and Hadios and as an explanation for why it's okay, you guys should reject it. And here's why it's because uh -huh. you're asking people to build hypermedia clients, which are complicated. And then even when you've done that, is there, is there something with agency that can want to do something on the other end of that pipe? And if there isn't, then why bother with all this stuff? Yeah. Well, but you know, <laughs> Again, this is hypothetical, but that's where the rel attribute may come in, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's more so, information for sure. Oh yeah. So anyway, I, I don't want to keep too much uh, of your time, Carson. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Session. Um, best of luck with. I think your book is fantastic, and uh, thank you. It should, uh, get the wider reach. Maybe next time we can just hook up. I want to. I'm curious about who's the mastermind between those brilliant tweets and all these like many laughs. laughs. Yeah, many laughs that's, a, believe it or not, that's just me sitting at just this desk. Brilliant, just, brilliant stuff. I'm having a lot yeah. of, I'm having a great time. It's it's a good, good laugh. Yeah, I enjoy making people laugh. That is a fun. It's a good thing. laugh. Like Some, sometimes people 
like, is this guy serious? They, they don't get the sarcasm and the <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. we are all like, I don't know. But one thing I'm not sure, probably I'm not uh, close enough with whatever is the vernacular, but what was this about the cream and the and the skim? <laughs> the skim milk thing? Yeah, that was a joke. So one thing that I do, so just this is, um, um, I mean, you know, from a marketing standpoint, people are like, oh, he's so brilliant. He figured out he could ship post his way to success. And it's like, no, I've been ship posting now for seven years on Twitter. <laughs> Nobody cared. It's just you get, you know, you got I got lucky that like some attention came and then I, I you know I, I did put out some pretty funny content. Um but you know HTMX, it's it's a library written almost entirely by me. Um there, there's some other people that, that help. Um but I, you know, I'm just one guy. I don't work at Google, I don't work at Facebook, I'm not like an ex-New York Times famous developer or any of that stuff. My stuff has been rejected. Like I've gotten more rejection letters for talks than I can, you know, uh, it's, it's it's so it's been a little bit tough. And so I kind of do have to do something different. And you know, it's just one of these things where I've I, I've always been a class clown and gotten in trouble and all that sort of stuff. So I don't mind doing that, and being silly, um, because it also doesn't really affect my my career or anything like that. Like I don't have to be serious. And it's funny now that I think it is an advantage. Like I can say something funny that if like React, if the React, you know, Twitter account tried to do it, everyone would be like, "What is going on?" You know, it doesn't make any sense. Whereas, like now, I've got this account that's already known to just be ridiculous, and I can, and so I can have fun and participate in a lot of the other ridiculousness uh, that's on the internet. And I think that's, you know, Twitter has gone had its ups and downs, um, and it maybe, you know, maybe it's falling apart. I don't know, but right now it does feel pretty fun to me. You know, okay. it's not it's not an election year. We'll see how next year is. <laughs> election years are election yeah. years are always miserable on Twitter. I know. Um, but I, <laughs> but, but right I, now I it's hope, pretty fun. Yeah, I, I hope you don't mind. Sometimes I, I bomb your thread. I go in and I no, just absolutely. Say yeah. I, it's I, Twitter. I, yeah, <laughs> so I like I yeah. like when I, I like it when the tables are all of a sudden turned, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's exactly. Like, it's over, we are so back. It's over, we are so yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you know, try and keep it fun. And the milk thing was like someone they started talking about drinking milk. And they were saying, you know, 2% versus skim versus whole milk. And I was like, guys, if you're not drinking heavy cream, I, heavy I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell you. Oh, really? <laughs> I've actually had heavy cream and coffee before, and it is pretty heavy. I don't it's... actually drink. Don't tell any of the people on Twitter, but I don't actually drink heavy cream. Okay. Uh, I, I, drink, right. I drink, I drink, I uh, drink whole milk. Yep. So. That's good. So skim milk is evil. <laughs> I'm not a big fan. No, me neither. Okay, on that note, I really sincerely uh, thank you for spending yeah. time here. I, I hope sure. this will reach people and uh, help them um, go back to full uh, full stack. Yep. Learn the top to bottom and be your own master of your own destiny. Don't depend on yeah. framework. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And again, I want to say thank you to you as someone who was willing to look at HTMX early on. Now, I mean, there's a lot of people that are. Oh, HTMX is so obvious, but two years ago, years no ago, one was I, talking about it. So. I can tell you, I immediately recognized, like, uh-huh. Yeah. Because I'm a, I'm a yeah. big fan of REST and Hatius, right? Sure. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they, this is going the right direction. So definitely. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. And, well, and it's funny, too, because I wrote all those essays and nobody cared. And then I post, now I post memes and everyone, like, goes nuts. I'm <laughs> just like, yes. come on. <laughs> we live in the, in the... Read the essays, too. <laughs> I know, but we, we live in the anti-intellectual times yeah. right so i mean you know, i don't want to be too hard on people but, yeah. i know just kidding okay yeah. thank you again uh dinner time right so yeah, yeah i gotta go i gotta go grill some chicken so i will okay. uh, thank you, person i'll well, talk to you later yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna just now stop recording and uh, talk soon yep